Hello, I'm Dr. Carl Illig, and this is a Society for Vascular Surgery briefing about lysis and early decompression for venous thoracic outlet syndrome. Paget Schroeder syndrome, also referred to as effort thrombosis, refers to primary thrombosis of the subclavian vein at the costoclavicular junction. It's the most severe presentation of venous thoracic outlet syndrome and results in severe disability if unrecognized or improperly treated. The clinical presentation is classic with the patient complaining of a blue, swollen, heavy, painful arm. 60 to 80 percent of patients report a history of vigorous exercise or activity involving the upper extremities, and approximately 85 percent of patients will have symptoms within 24 hours of the inciting event. The diagnosis is usually straightforward from the history and physical examination, and duplex ultrasound is very accurate. Anticoagulation alone leaves up to half of patients chronically symptomatic. The modern algorithm is thrombolysis to clear the vein of clot, followed by surgical decompression of the venous thoracic outlet. It's critical to understand that venous thoracic outlet syndrome is a disorder of the anterior part of the thoracic outlet region, where the subclavian vein passes by the intersection of the clavicle and first rib. While the posterior cephalad portion of this area is open, the subclavius muscle underlying the clavicle and costoclavicular ligament impinge upon the vein, even at rest. The group at UCLA, led by Herb Macleader, introduced the concept of catheter-directed thrombolysis, followed by thoracic outlet decompression, in the 1980s with superb results. Decompression at that point was usually staged by two to three months because of the fear of complications, but because up to 33% of patients suffered reocclusion in this interval, the pendulum is shifted to immediate decompression occurring during the same admission or even the same trip to the operating room. This is an excellent case for a hybrid operating room, but no matter what, the procedure starts with imaging and intervention. It's stressed that access should be obtained in a deep vein, either the brachial or basilic vein in the antecubital fossa or brachiobasilic or even axillary veins higher in the arm. Ultrasound guided access is almost always required for proper access in this situation. If the cephalic vein is used, the venous system peripheral to its insertion is inaccessible to therapy and damage can occur during instrumentation. Imaging confirms the diagnosis. It should be stressed that the presence or absence of collaterals is critical to note. If the vein looks open but collaterals are seen, a lesion must be present. The first step is to cross the lesion with a wire. This is usually very easy if the clot is fresh, but can be harder if more chronic. Once a wire is across the lesion, thrombolysis is performed. We suggest that aggressive pharmacomechanical thrombolysis should be considered. The angiojet power pulse technique, for example, infusing the clot with TPA and let it percolate for half an hour or so works very well. If the vein is completely cleared, leave the sheath in. If not, conventional catheter-directed thrombolysis should be carried out for the next 24 to 48 hours. And it should be stressed that endovascular intervention should not be considered at this point, no matter what the temptation. Venoplasty will not help until the bones are decompressed and may hurt by creating micro tears. Stenting in the situation will do nothing but complicate further therapy and should be condemned. Whether or not the vein can be opened, the thoracic outlet should be subsequently decompressed. There are many ways of doing this, but transaxillary exposure yields superb access to and visualization of the anterior part of the first rib at the costoclavicular junction, and most feel this approach is best in this situation. It should be stressed that there are several critical steps to this procedure. Resection of the first rib all the way to the sternum, resection of the costoclavicular tendon and often the subclavius muscle, and thorough external subclavian venolysis. We try to mobilize the vein circumferentially all the way down to the level of the innominate vein. Formal venous reconstruction is sometimes required in this situation, and this situation frequently requires complex exposure and a different surgical approach. If the vein was completely open during thrombolysis, first rib excision alone is adequate. If the vein was recanalized but a stenosis persists, the sheath should be left in and the vein re-imaged after rib excision. If a defect persists after thorough venolysis, balloon venoplasty or even repair can be considered. And finally, if the vein cannot be opened by thrombolysis, 
first rib excision is still indicated as it relieves symptoms in many and is associated with spontaneous recanalization in some. The patient should be anticoagulated following this procedure. So to summarize and stress several critical points, the problem should be treated immediately upon diagnosis as success drops off quickly with time, 14 days being a convenient memory aid. Such patients should undergo thrombolysis and surgical decompression of the thoracic outlet should follow in essentially all cases whether or not the vein has been reopened. It's critical to address the anterior part of the thoracic outlet to remove as much as possible of the muscle, tendon, and other tissue in this area and to specifically mobilizing the vein, lysing all external scar tissue. Endovascular intervention should not be performed until after the thoracic outlet has decompressed and stents should be used only with extreme caution and after a lot of experience. And finally, formal venous reconstruction in this situation frequently saves the patient a lot of morbidity down the road, but such intervention is advanced and should be individualized. This briefing is made possible by a grant from Cook Medical. To learn more about vascular health, visit vascularweb.org.